the hallway conversation this morning was talking about recycling and the fact that everything we're doing now has been done before and that there seems to be a cycle in the technology industry that we can take wisdom from the past and bring it forward. So I spent 26 years at Intel through their PC revolution doing what we called ecosystem development and now we're basically calling industry development. And the open roads activity is all about unifying an industry or many industries into a you know, directional future that's good for ourselves and our customers. And so we actually know where we're taking things. And in that type of focus, the best person I could think of that has done that for me and for the industry is Andy Grove. Many of you know Andy. He was the, the CEO at Intel that took us from one to $40 billion of revenue, pretty much drove through the transition to microprocessors into the PC industry. Many of you may not know that Andy is probably one of the most quotable people in the world. And if you go online, you can find an Andy quote just about anywhere you look because he studied the market. He even taught at Stanford Business School a uh, a course called Strategy in Action. I got to take the second version of that just because I was a test case with him. Um, he was my mentor at Intel. And I started a standard body well, called the Desktop Managed Task Force, and you can see that on the board out here. This is the original logo. And true to form, he, he gave the keynote at the beginning Desktop Management Task Force element. And I'm getting the benefit of giving a keynote at the beginning Open Roads element. But Logos change, activities change, but the things we have to do really don't. Andy basically said market segments and market segment share is one during transitions. We could call transitions transformations, but it's when a market changes. And I want to go through two of those examples that you're probably aware of, but you may not know what the industry development work behind the scenes was. And I want to bring you through that. <clears throat> the first is the path to a billion connected computers. Andy in 1998 said, we're going to get to a billion connected computers. And lo and behold, we magically did write about now. It took PCs and phones to pull it off. It wasn't just PCs, but the industry was actually able to deliver over a billion people connected and now with phones, it's actually taking off. And as we add Internet of Things, it's going to exponentially grow. The reason that we are able to do that happens to be a concept of moving from vertical to horizontal. In the 60s and 70s, we had what was called a vertical industry. We had IBM, DEC, HP, Burroughs, RCA, everybody competing for a mainframe and the customer. Well, if you see the volumes, they were pretty small. When we knocked that over and created what we would call an ecosystem or horizontal play, the volumes accelerated because more people could play, more people could buy. It became a, an affordable market. I had the privilege and the job of going through that change. The first thing we were talking about in the hallway was the fact that back in the 90s, every time you turned on a PC, it broke. You know, you were adding software, it broke. You added hardware, it broke. There was no way to grow the industry if customer support cost more than the product. And so we had to fix that, and that was what the DMTF was about, was actually working as an industry to solve the problem of making things work. And things that came out of that are things like the Microsoft registry, plug and play, the, the hardware wizard to set things up. We literally got the industry to start fixing their own problems. Why did Intel do that? Because if they couldn't fix their problems, we couldn't sell our products. And all of a sudden, the symbiotic relationship of an ecosystem program arrived. The second one I did, big one I did, was the Mobilized Software Initiative, because when we added Wi-Fi, all of the software broke, because they were expecting a wire, and all of a sudden, the wire broke when you walked away from the signal. So we had to get this software industry to retool before we introduced the laptop with Wi-Fi, or they were going to say Intel's products break. 
again, we are actually interconnected in many ways in that task. But initiatives are about setting a direction. We didn't have to solve. We didn't have to, you know, two things I liked out of that. Microsoft made Outlook work right, and Adobe eventually in invented a product called Adobe Air. Those two came directly out of that initiative, totally different architectures. In other words, we didn't have to tell them how to do it. We had to tell them what to do. And they took the rest of it. The next level is standardization. In other words, sometimes you have to tell them how. And, and IEEE and other standards that we're all involved with are really down to the bit. But when you're actually a large organization or a group of organizations, you can create a de facto standard. So DMTF actually created the beginnings of what Intel called the Wired for Management Initiative. And what we did there was simply create a toolkit to teach hardware vendors how to instrument their technologies so that software could talk to it. Very simple, but since we were a big enough player, we didn't have to go through the effort of starting a standards body. We could actually publish something and make that forward. Where I'm going there is not every path has to be the same in this model. And then lastly, I always wondered what an alliance was. And finally, I figured it out when we started up the Fast Ethernet Alliance to do 100 megabit Ethernet. Alliances are about making money. And typically, you have a bunch of engineers that think they're making something work together. The reality is what alliances are about making money. We sat in a room with 3Com, Synoptics, Intel, HP, Grand Central at the time. Every one of us had a different Six signaling interface. We had a cat, Category 3 telephone cable and Cat 5. HP had its own super secret token ring type thing. And everybody said, mine's best. At that moment, we failed. We failed not because every one didn't work. We failed because nobody could buy one. But today, when you go up to your room, you can actually plug that little Category 5 cable into your PC. That's because of this organization. We agreed that even though Synoptics had Telephone Cat 3 that was really nice and you wouldn't have to recable, we agreed that for the industry it was better to all agree to do it one way, and that took off. The 100 megabit revolution of 1995 took off. And that became the gigabit and then the 10 gigabit. And now Huawei is part of an internet or an ethernet alliance because they kept rebuilding an alliance to the next generation. Now there's a standing body, and that body's job is to help us sell by agreeing to move forward on a common destination. We did it faster with Wi-Fi because Intel just said, hey, if that's how it works, we'll just create this little standard called Wi-Fi, stick it up in an airport, and if your computer talks to it, you're compliant. We accelerated the task. It doesn't matter which one was right, it's which one worked. Very different thought process than some of the standards people, but it's path to money. And Ray Norda of Nobel labeled this coopetition. And Ray was instrumental in this because we had to get Ray to sign the agreement to do DMTF so that Bill Gates would agree to do DMTF. So we literally got, to, got Ray's signature as a way of getting Microsoft in the door, and, and then it took off from there. But he knew that he wasn't going to succeed against Microsoft. He had to succeed with Microsoft. And that's the, that's the task of the industry element. So I'm going to go through a few Andy quotes because I, I like them, number one. But I'm also bringing you to my last Andy quote in the close as a challenge. And he said, basically, adapt or die. Dr. Long said, it's moving faster, there's new things. Our job is to adapt. It's not going to go any slower, and there's not going to be people waiting for us. They're going to be moving ahead. And so as we look at that, I want to go through the second major transition that I worked with, which was the transition to servers. And the, turning an Intel PC on its side and labeling it a server. That's what we did first. We just, you know, my Novell servers were just the secretary PC, right? And we had to actually turn that into a real industry. And I was one of the first five people in Intel's server industry, and we were trying to figure out how to do it. And 
lo and behold, over four years, we had an amazing loser in this equation, which was the Unix community. And we had a major winner, which people labeled the Wintel community or ecosystem. And we literally had a swap of almost 100% market segment share over four years. Let me show you how that happened. First, we established a vision, very similar to Open Roads, that said there's a new normal, there's a new thing. And it wasn't e-business back then, and it wasn't cloud, and it wasn't service-oriented, because none of those labels were there yet. My program was called the Third Generation Internet Business, and Bill like, Gates labeled his program the Third Generation Business Internet. He didn't like, Intel and Microsoft were like always feuding. So he just swept the words around so that was theirs. So I actually did one better for Scaled Out. We had a program called Scale Out, and, or Standardize and Scale, and Microsoft had a program called Scale Out. And so I just said, okay, if they like Scale Out, if Intel and Microsoft both use the term, we started publishing our documents. The whole market started understanding this concept of scalable servers in about a month. Every media, every person, every article you read, why? Because we had a common voice. We weren't arguing about the terms. And you watched that explode. Then we did one better, is we stopped arguing about whose spec was better, and we merged our hardware specs. And we published them together. And not just Intel and Microsoft, there was HP and IBM and, and Dell and Acer, and I'm, I'm trying to think of who else back then, AST, Compaq. There were seven major server vendors, NEC. Everybody agreed. And what that allowed us to do is not only have a spec, but we are actually able to ship a shippable reference architecture to all seven server vendors, which means all they had to do is put their logo on it, and they shipped the next platform. So we were able to create a standard across multiple vendors in the industry in one generation because they all had the same product. And then they started competing to make it better. Now, this was a very creative solution, by the way. Most people don't ship their you know, best product to all their customers and say you can all sell it. But by doing that, the market knew what to buy. They knew it was safe. They could buy from multiple vendors, and we accelerated the market, which leads to alliances again. How do we make money on that? Well, we now had to work with new players, some of them in this room. In 1996, or, or, yeah, 1996, we started our SAP Alliance. This is the 2015 version of the SAP Alliance. But we started working with integrated software vendors. Then we got Oracle to create a lab. And then, I call it the coup de grace, we actually got Capgemini to co-sell with Intel. Very interesting concept. We'd never succeeded. We'd had five system integrated programs in Intel. They'd all failed. We finally learned how to do it in teaming together. But what we did was we stopped IBM and HP and others from being the bottleneck in a sale. We stopped Accenture and EDS and others from being the primary sale. We now co-sold with the ISV direct to customer. And so when this happens, you start watching this market segment share go down because overnight, you could replace them with an Intel server with a standard architecture. And the customers were happier. They were saving money. They knew what to buy. And they were bypassing a whole layer of expense, millions of dollars of expense. And that's a true story. That's the story that people read about, but they don't necessarily know how it happened. And how that story happens today now is, is Andy defined this thing called a strategic inflection point. That's when everything's changing, whether you like it or not. And everything I've read about this group is saying modernization, transformation, change, 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 right? We're at a labeled inflection point, but we also have to start thinking about how we make a change in an inflection point. And so when we're working on an industry environment, the old way of working and the normal way of working is you're, you're trying to get market segment share. You're trying to compete Orange against Vodafone. You're trying to bring your custom, grow your customer base. 
traditional sales and marketing. The problem with that is you're competing inside your industry. You're not changing your industry. When you go, oops, I went backwards. When you go to an industry concept, you're cooperating to grow your market. It's the same competitor, but you're now cooperating to change your market. You're creating demand, you're opening up new markets. And why this is important is the question of who are we and why are we here? The overall industry development effort that Open Roads represents is a growing the market for all of us and competing in the next generation market because we're leading it. It's not trying to be the leaders right now in the market we're in. And what's scary is when we saw this IDC picture, I actually saw the inflection point. Do you see the inflection point? Here's 25 operators that are putting CapEx in, and there's four new ones. Now, my question to you is, who's operating in what model? And I would argue that these colors are mostly operating, trying to get market segment share, win customers back and forth from each other, and doing traditional business. This color, the Amazons, Microsofts, Googles, apples of the world are a whole different animal. They're trying to grow market. They're trying to capture market. They're trying to lead industries. That's the competition. And by the way, that's the inflection point. We now have traditional telcos that are on their way to modernization, cloud service providers, emerging IoT, big data, and I'll I like these to be the new roads, the new highways coming at us and all of our traditional enterprise customers, all trying to make it work. Now, Andy would have coined this, but I did because he's not around. Whoever builds wins. In other words, the winner of this inflection point is whoever builds wins. Now, I would say whoever integrates and builds wins, if you want to extend it, but to make it simple, we have to own the customer to win. And I'm going to paint two scenarios. Because if Andy was here, and, and sadly Andy passed away a couple months ago, and if he was here, and this is his quote, but I added the we to it, you know, we can be the subject of an inflection point. Subject would mean we're a commoditized telecommunications. Cloud's coming in and they're capturing the new markets and our traditional customers. Or we can be the cause. We can be the change agents. We modernize telco. They maintain connections to the customer. The service provider industry, the cloud service provider is just one of them. I'm going to challenge you that this is the vision I see for open roads. And if we don't take that vision, we've got a bunch of people chasing our tails. And so, I don't have any better option than to try to show a picture of success. Success is option B. And that's what I see as a newcomer to the Open Roads environment, but that's what I see the vision of Open Roads is, is that model. And I hope we find that today. Thank you.